I just lost the slides of name. Uh, I'd like to say thank you very much to the organisers for the opportunity to speak here. I'm coming, coming from Scotland, it's a, a great pleasure to see that uh, Spain also has rain. And we're going to a much simpler open now. I love that. Good, thank you. So, any talk on um, liver regeneration um, traditionally should start with a picture of Prometheus, who um, was here being punished, and the liver, uh, his liver was eaten every day, and every night um, his liver regenerated. And this was the first experiment demonstrating liver regeneration. Now, the interesting thing is, as far as we know, he never got liver cancer. And that's one of the points that I'll, I'll talk about later, because when you get multiple rounds of regeneration and repair, you can eventually get cancer. Okay, so just a little bit of background about normal liver regeneration, and then I'm going to talk about abnormal liver regeneration in disease. So in normal liver regeneration, um, you can cut away two-thirds of the liver, and this is here in the rat, and in 10 days it will grow back. And you can do exactly the same thing in patients. So in our liver transplant unit, um, we sometimes get a couple, and, and it may be the wife who needs a liver transplant, or it may be the husband. Um, the partner gives uh, part of their liver, and over time, these will go back to exactly the same size. Now, because that's a normal liver, um, we know uh, that, that it occurs through hepatocyte division. You can label the hepatocytes with BRDU, the proliferating cells, and it's very simple. And in injury as well, it's exactly the same. So if we take uh, an injury, such as a, a, a drug that injures hepatocytes acutely, hepatocyte division will very quickly heal this, this damage. And, and there's no activation of a stem cell compartment in, in the normal liver. Now, the situation is different in, in, in cirrhosis and cancer, and I'll talk about that later, but um, um, that does lead on to the different sorts of targets for liver um, cell therapy or stem cell therapy. Um, and it's perhaps the simplest one to talk about to start with, is in the situation of metabolic liver diseases, where there may, may be just a single gene that's abnormal. Now here's an example, this is from Maurizio Moraca, um, who was in Padua at the time, now in Rome, uh, where he performed a hepatocyte transplant for a glycogen storage disorder of the liver. Now this is an enzymatic defect, and if you like, it, it's really a form of, of gene therapy using a cell. And um, after the patient received these hepatocytes, there was an improvement in the metabolic profile. The blood glucose was better, uh, and the enzyme worked better. Now, the problem is really this, this little bit here, two billion. Where do you get two billion hepatocytes from? Normally, if we have billions of hepatocytes, we call that a liver, and we normally transplant the whole liver. And the challenge is where to, where to actually get these hepatocytes from. And this is where stem cells may offer a solution in the future. Now, in metabolic liver disease, the niche or the environment you're transplanting the hepatocytes into is quite good. The soil is receptive for a transplant. And the clinical studies suggest that hepatocyte transplantation for metabolic disease has, has uh, a good clinical impact. And therefore, if we can take stem cells and grow hepatocytes, it's likely we'd be able to also get a good result if the stem cells are stable and uh, have good phenotype. Now, obviously, this has been done with human embryonic stem cells. This was in uh, uh, Edinburgh uh, with David Hay using human embryonic stem cells to grow hepatocyte-like cells. 
There are issues here, uh, there's ethical issues, of course, using embryonic stem cells. There are immunological issues in that um, unless you have an extensive stem cell bank, you may still need immunosuppression. There's a question of functionality. And, and really, although some of the hepatocyte functions are present, some aren't, some many aren't, and also there's a question of stability, particularly over many years, are they going to be stable with cells? And we've heard a very nice introduction of in IPS cells, so I don't really need to, to, go, to go into that in any de detail. But again, uh, uh, in Edinburgh, we showed that human IPS cells could be differentiated using very similar protocols which rely on wind uh, developmental gene to differentiate these cells into uh, mature hepatocytes. Now that gives the opportunity of uh, uh, doing autologous therapy, but clearly if this was for a, a genetic disease, one well, would need to do a bit of gene surgery to, to try and correct the abnormality, otherwise you'd be giving the same problem back again. And this, this approach has been taken uh, by uh, Ludwig Vallier, uh, again with David Lomas, he's a leader in alpha-1 antitrypsin, um, in, the, in the context of IPS-derived hepatocytes. And this is an example of alpha-1 antitrypsin, where there's an abnormal enzyme in the hepatocyte, and that abnormal enzyme has two, causes two problems. It causes lung problems because the, the enzyme isn't secreted to the lungs, and therefore patients get uh, emphysema but it causes a liver problem because the abnormal protein collects in the liver and eventually can cause cirrhosis uh, and even uh, 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 liver failure. Now, um, using uh, a zinc finger piggyback approach, they were able to uh, uh, correct uh, the mutation uh, in alpha-1 antitrypsin in hu human IPS cells. And then we're able to differentiate them into hepatocyte-like cells in vitro. And when they did this, uh, uh, they got the correct phenotype. So here, they didn't get uh, in the differentiated hepatocyte-like cells accumulation of abnormal protein. And when they transplanted these cells in, in, a, in an immunodeficient mouse, they were able to get uh, colonies of cells which made human albumin and also uh, uh, were making alpha-1 antitrypsin and they could detect uh, albumin secretion in the serum. So that's quite encouraging. The clinical, so this is very exciting, but the clinical application of this technology will be quite challenging. Um, it may be that using um, um, small patches of corrected cells in the liver or somewhere else, we can correct the lung defect by making the enzyme but you, you're going to have a severe challenge to correct every hepatocyte in the liver because um, that's what you need to do to prevent any form of liver disease. Uh, but it's an interesting uh, move forward. Now, the, the area I, I work in mostly is end stage is, is cirrhosis and this is really 95% of our patients are from cirrhotic. Um, you know, the metabolic disease is quite rare. Uh, we do get fulminants, but a lot of them are cirrhosis. And cirrhosis leads to cancer, and, and it's a big, big problem. And it's a particular problem in uh, where I'm based in Scotland, where we're now the European gold medalists in cirrhosis. And now 50, one, uh, one in 50 of all Scottish deaths are due to liver cirrhosis. And if you co-culture progenitors, and macrophages, you find that you can get much stronger pattern in down the hepatocyte phenotype, and wind pathways are activated. But if you inhibit it with a wind blocker uh, here with one, that is lost, and the progenitors then go down a biliary phenotype. So th that is a control pathway. And in vivo, what you can do during models of hepatocyte injury, you can delete macrophages. So in hepatocyte injury and regeneration, the progenitors normally spread out into the liver and, and take up a hepatocyte phenotype. But if you delete macrophages by liposomal clodronate, these progenitors form into these biliary structures. And if you laser capture, uh, sorry, if you digest them out, 
that they, they have gene expression and phenotypic markers of biliary cells rather than of hepatocyte cells. Now, in chronic liver disease, uh, over time, what happens is the liver is shrinking and you're getting more and more duct forming, these ductular formation of biliary-like cells. And what you're not getting is enough hepatocyte-like cells. So that's, that's a key issue. And what, what the challenge is, is to try and improve regeneration by driving regeneration down a hepatocyte phenotype rather than down a biliary phenotype. And this is a patient who had a transplant and got reinfected with hepatitis C. And very quickly, we can see within a matter of months, they get these biliary structures forming uh, and they get this niche forming of macrophages and myofibroblasts. And it's a niche which actually drives fibrosis and it's not a regenerative, it's not helpful in a regenerative sense. Liver function then fails. So the question is, can you do anything about this? Can you alter the pathway of regeneration in a therapeutic sense? And, and you can by expressing WINTs in the progenitors. So you can do this genetically in mice by using mice where under the keratin-19 promoter, you express a stabilized WINT. And if you do that, what you get is much more uh, uh, production of uh, uh, hepatocytes from the progenitor cells rather than biliary cells. So you can, at least in mice, control the regeneration pattern. So that's a challenge to try and take this to the clinic. So now I think we have a, a model of a regenerative niche in the liver where the progenitors can form either biliary cells or can form either hepatocytes. Uh, and it's a crosstalk and it's a link between injury which determines this. And we now have targets to try and therapeutically target. Now, in cirrhosis, what you really want to do is target the scar tissue because we have lots and lots of collagen scar and, and stimulant regeneration. You really have to do both. If you do one without the other, um, there's been very little in the way of success. So I'm just going to mention some of the clinical studies that have gone on in this way. There's been quite a large number now of um, small studies where people have taken autologous um, cells, and they're either autologous hematopoietic cells, uh, stem cells, CD34, uh, or uh, mononuclear cells from the bone marrow, isolated these cells and reinfused them into the liver to try and improve regeneration. Now, to date, these studies have been uncontrolled, um, largely uncontrolled. In other words, not randomized uh, with control arms. There have been small numbers, and there's been limited measures of improvement. There's often been mixed populations. The donor cells have not been tracked, and there's little in the way of mechanistic insights. They're, they're, they're obviously interesting studies to look at, but it's difficult to make firm conclusions from them. But here, here, here is one of the more interesting ones, and this comes from Tarai and Sakaida in Japan, um, where they've isolated mononuclear cells from patients with cirrhosis. And here, what they've done is taken out bone marrow, and this is quite a big procedure because you have to uh, give a general anesthetic to the patient, um, isolate mononuclear cells, and then what they do is reinfuse them peripherally um, into patients. And what they see is their liver, their serum albumin improve, and their child pusco, which is a marker of liver injury, go down. And when they do biopsies, they see activation of progenitors and improvement in, in liver proliferation, liver regeneration. So it's quite encouraging, but it is uncontrolled. Um, so we have to be cautious about that. <coughs> There has more recently been a controlled study using mononuclear cells um, to try and uh, improve liver regeneration in patients with cirrhosis, and this comes from uh, Laurent Spa, um, <coughs> and it's a very nice study. And patients were randomized to either get the bone marrow cell therapy or, or, or control, and then patients were followed up. 
Unfortunately, when they looked over time, there was really uh, very little difference uh, between the, the uh, both, uh, mononuclear group or, or the control group. And so we couldn't really draw a conclusion that this was useful. Now, that's a, sort of, that's a mixed population. And we thought, well, we've got to try and understand the biology of this a bit more uh, if we want to go in and do a clinical study. So what we know in the liver, if we take away liver injury, uh, whatever the form of liver injury is, be it alcohol, or be it metabolic disease, or to immune disease, fatty liver, if we can actually treat that, we can get a, a partial regeneration of the liver. Now the sooner we do that, the better the regeneration is. And, um, it is only a partial regeneration in cirrhosis, usually. And work, um, so here's somebody, sorry, here's somebody with cirrhosis who got a, a hepatitis B, and they got a, a, a drug to treat that hepatitis B, and we can see the amount of blue collagen is much less, and the liver has regener regenerating nicely. So there is regeneration capacity, even when there's cirrhosis. Now, if we look, in, in the scar area, the area of scarring during this regeneration process, what we found is that there's a big influx of macrophages, and these are bone marrow derived macrophages. We can label them and they're circulating in from the bone marrow. And what you can do is deplete those macrophages during this recovery to see if they're just passengers or whether they have a natural functional effect. So this is where, using the CD11B DTR mouse, where uh, the DTR receptor is cloned in uh, under the control of CD11B, and by giving DTR toxin, you can delete these macrophages. And if you do that during, during the recovery phase, uh, you actually get a less recovery. So there's still lots of scar tissue there that's not re been resolved. So it seems as though macrophages are important in this regeneration process. So um, we sought to try and exploit this therapeutically by seeing whether we can develop a cell therapy based upon macrophages. And this is a mouse model of liver cirrhosis with carbon tetrachloride, where we give a single injection of 10 to 6 macrophages, which are mature bone marrow derived macrophages. But they, they're not particularly polarized, uh, they're just matured. And if one does that, we find a, 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 a decrease in the amount of scar tissue here, seen in serous red stain for collagen, and my fibroblasts go down the scar forming cells in the liver uh, quite significantly. And you don't get the effect with uh, whole bone marrow, uh, whole bone marrow makes it worse, suggesting that you know, if you use whole bone marrow or in salt of fractions, you can actually make things worse. <coughs> and by giving the macrophage injection, we'd see a significant regulation of matrix metalloproteinases, which are the enzymes which decrease scar tissue in the liver, uh, and these go up very highly. And what's um, surprising is the degree of improvement you get and the degree of infiltration, because the macrophages are only there transiently. But what they're doing is this, they're actually signaling to endogenous macrophages, uh, and in fact also neutrophils, and bringing them into the scar area. Um, and I, I think this creates an amplification effect from the original cell therapy. And in fact, the macrophage, and if you co-culture progenitors and macrophages, you find that you can get much stronger patterning down the hepatocyte phenotype, and wind pathways are activated, but if you inhibit it with a wind blocker uh, here with one, that is lost, and the progenitors then go down a biliary phenotype. So th that is a controlled pathway. And in vivo, what you can do during models of hepatocyte injury, you can delete macrophages. So in hepatocyte injury regeneration, the progenitors normally spread out into the liver, and, and take up a, a bad side phenotype, but if you delete macrophages by liposomal clogenate, these progenitors form into these biliary structures, and if you laser capture, uh, so if you digest them out, 
the, the, the uh, gene expression and phenotypic markers of biliary cells rather than of hepatocyte cells. Now, in chronic liver disease, uh, over time, what happens is the liver is shrinking and you're getting more and more duct forming, these ductular formation of biliary like cells. And what you're not getting is enough hepatocyte like cells. So that's, that's a key issue. And what, what the challenge is, is to try and improve regeneration by driving regeneration down a hepatocyte phenotype rather than down a biliary phenotype. And this is a patient who had a transplant and got reinfected with hepatitis C. And very quickly, we can see within a matter of months, they get these biliary structures forming uh, and they get this niche forming of macrophages and myofibroblasts. And it's a niche which actually drives fibrosis and it's not a regenerative, it's not helpful in a regenerative sense. Liver function then fails. So the question is, can you do anything about this? Can you alter the pathway of regeneration in a therapy? sense. And, and you can by expressing wints in the progenitors. So you can do this genetically in mice by using mice where under the keratin-19 promoter you express a stabilized wint. And if you do that, what you get is much more uh, uh, production of uh, uh, hepatocytes from the progenitor cells rather than biliary cells. So you can, at least in mice, control the regeneration pattern. So that's a challenge to try and take this to the clinic. So now I think we have a, a model of a regenerative niche in the liver where the progenitors can form either biliary cells or can form either hepatocytes. Uh, and it's a crosstalk and it's a link between injury which determines this. And we now have targets to try and therapeutically target. Now, in cirrhosis, what you really want to do is target the scar tissue because we have lots and lots of collagen scar and, and stimulant regeneration. You really have to do both. If you do one without the other, um, there's been very little in the way of success. So I'm just going to mention some of the clinical studies that have gone on in this way. There's been quite a large number now of um, small studies where people have taken autologous um, cells and they're either autologous hematopoietic cells, uh, stem cells, CD34, uh, or uh, mononuclear cells from the bone marrow, isolated these cells and reinfused them into the liver to try and improve regeneration. Now, to date, these studies have been uncontrolled, um, largely uncontrolled. In the words, not randomized uh, with control arms, there have been small numbers, and there's been limited measures of improvement. It's often been mixed populations, the donor cells have not been tracked, and there's little in the way of mechanistic insights. They're, they're, they're obviously interesting studies to look at, but it's difficult to make firm conclusions from them. But here, here, here is one of the more interesting ones, and this comes from Tarai and Sakaido in Japan, um, where they've isolated mononuclear cells from patients with cirrhosis. And here what they've done is taken out bone marrow, and this is quite a big procedure because you have to uh, give a general anaesthetic to the patient, um, isolate mononuclear cells, and then what they do is reinfuse them peripherally um, into patients. And what they see is their liver, their serum albumin improve and their child puce called the marker of liver injury go down. And when they do biopsies, they see activation of progenitors and the improvement in, in liver proliferation, liver regeneration. So it's quite encouraging, but it is uncontrolled. Um, so we have to be cautious about that. <coughs> there has more recently been a controlled study using mononuclear cells um, to try and uh, improve liver regeneration in patients with cirrhosis, and this comes from uh, Laurent Spa, um, and, and it's a very nice study. And patients were randomized to either get the bone marrow cell therapy or, or, or control, and then patients were followed up. 
Unfortunately, when they looked over time, there was really uh, very little difference uh, between the, the uh, boat, uh, mononuclear group or, or the control group. And so we couldn't really draw a conclusion that this was useful. Now, that's a, sort of, that's a mixed population. And we thought, well, we've got to try and understand the biology of this a bit more uh, if we want to go in and do a clinical study. So what we know in the liver, if we take away liver injury, uh, whatever the form of liver injury is, be it alcohol, or be it metabolic disease, or to immune disease, fatty liver, if we can actually treat that, we can get a, a partial regeneration of the liver. Now the sooner we do that, the better the regeneration is. And, um, it is only a partial regeneration in cirrhosis, usually. And work, um, so here's somebody, sorry, here's somebody with cirrhosis who got a, a hepatitis B, and they got a, a, a drug to treat that hepatitis B, and we can see the amount of blue collagen is much less, and the liver has regener regenerating nicely. So there is regeneration capacity, even when there's cirrhosis. Now, if we look, in, in the scar area, the area of scarring during this regeneration process, what we found is that there's a big influx of macrophages, and these are bone marrow derived macrophages. We can label them and they're circulating in from the bone marrow. And what you can do is deplete those macrophages during this recovery to see if they're just passengers or whether they have an actual functional effect. So this is work using the CD11B DTR mouse, where uh, the DTR receptor is cloned in uh, under the control of CD11B. And by giving DTR toxin, you can delete these macrophages. And if you do that during, during the recovery phase, uh, you actually get a less recovery. So there's still lots of scar tissue there that's not re been resolved. So it seems as though macrophages are important in this regeneration process. So um, we sought to try and exploit this therapeutically by seeing whether we can develop a cell therapy based on macrophages. And this is a mouse model of liver cirrhosis with carbon tetrachloride, where we give a single injection of 10 to 6 macrophages, which are mature bone marrow derived macrophages. They, they're not particularly polarized, uh, they're just matured. And if one does that, we find a, 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 a decrease in the amount of scar tissue here, seen in serous red stain for collagen, and my fibroblasts go down the scar forming cells in the liver uh, quite significantly. And you don't get the effect with uh, whole bone marrow, uh, whole bone marrow makes it worse, suggesting that you know, if you use whole bone marrow or in salt of fractions, you can actually make things worse. <coughs> and by giving the macrophage injection, we see a significant upregulation of matrix metalloproteinases, which is the enzymes which decrease scar tissue in the liver, uh, and these go up very highly. And what's um, surprising is the degree of improvement you get and the degree of infiltration, because the macrophages are only there transiently. But what they're doing is this, they're actually signaling to endogenous macrophages, uh, and in fact also neutrophils, and bringing them into the scar area. Um, and I, I think this creates an amplification effect from the original cell therapy. And in fact, the macrophages are very highly expressive of chemokines, such as MCP1 and others, which drag in the endogenous cells. So for your one cell injected, you actually get a multiplication of the effect. And in response to that, we can see an improvement in serum albumin um, and um, liver function and the progenitor cells are activated. Now, the progenitor response, uh, um, in response to the macrophages, the activation was, was, was um, something that was intriguing. And in fact, what we found is that in response to just a sim single bone marrow injection in the tail vein of the mouse peripherally, 
we get a very uh, large activation of these progenitor cells in the liver, which is quite surprising because normally, as I mentioned at the very start, these progenitor cells are only normally activated when there's advanced liver disease, severe liver injuries, and senescence. But in fact, um, a single injection of bone marrow will do exactly the same thing, and that's quite surprising. Uh, initially, we didn't believe it, but we repeated it many times, and if you irradiate the cells, the effect goes away. And it works either way, um, male into female, female into female, male into male, etc. And the liver weight increases. And in fact, if you, if you inject the bone marrow cells, um, you can then isolate progenitors from the liver and grow them at clonal density. And to be progenitors, they have to self-renew and form into biliary cells and hepatocytes. And you can actually show this in vitro uh, exactly that. And in, in the injected, the bone marrow injected mice, uh, um, you get an increase in these uh, progenitor cells activated in the liver. And, we, and in fact, it's the macrophages in the bone marrow that are responsible. Because if you just inject macrophages on their own, mature macrophages, you get exactly the same progenitor cell response with exactly the same magnitude. And in fact, if you deplete the macrophages here using the CD11 DTR system that we previously used, then you don't get a response. So it is a macrophage dependent system. And we know the signaling system, and the signaling is by a tweak, which um, is, is a TNF like cytokine. And we know that because we can use recipient mice that are knockout for the receptor, which is the FN14 receptor. If we have knockout of the FN14 receptor, um, what we get is very little or no response. And in fact, if we use donor bone marrow where tweak is knocked out, we get, exact, we get no response. So it is a tweak dependent effect that the macrophages are making. So I think we know now, really, to try and stimulate endogenous repair in the damaged liver, that uh, one approach we, is to inject uh, autologous cells. And if one inject them some macrophages, they make chemokines. Um, to attract in the uh, endogenous cells in the liver and to get an amplified effect. This is able to decrease uh, scar tissue by expression of matrix metalloproteinases and is also, through the stimulation of uh, tweak, able to activate the progenitor cells and through the expression of wind, able to differentiate the progenitor cells down the hepatocyte phenotype and hopefully improve liver regeneration. So because of its features, um, we've been um, attempting to uh, develop an autologous cell therapy in humans um, using um, bone marrow, uh, sorry, using uh, CD14 monocytes, which can be isolated at a high number from the peripheral blood using an apheresis machine. So if you're on your apheresis machine for a couple of hours, you can get very, very high numbers of CD14 monocytes. And we have a very simple technique for differentiating these into mature regenerative macrophages. And uh, in fact, if we inject these regenerative macrophages now into animal models, this is a nox skid mouse, where we've induced liver injury and fibrosis, what we see is a reduction in liver injury, a reduction in fibrosis, and an increase in, in liver regeneration. So the hope really is to go into a first in man study quite soon uh, uh, to, to trust this in cirrhotic patients. And encouragingly, in cirrhotic patients, we can take out their monocytes and get exactly the same regenerative uh, macrophages. Now, I mentioned before that, that there are quite a large number of um, uncontrolled studies uh, in the field, and therefore uh, we sought to um, perform um, a phase two randomized controlled trial of autologous cell, stem cell therapy for liver cirrhosis. And this is with uh, Dr. Phil, uh, Professor Phil Newsom in, in Birmingham. And really, 
what we're doing is isolating CD1 through 3 cells, and either patients receive standard care, or they re re receive GCSF, or they receive GCSF and repeat infusions of a CD1 through 3 cells. And we need to do this in 81 patients, and we're most of the way through, so hopefully we'll be able to report this quite soon. And uh, we measure their liver function, their MELD, and UKELD scores. And these scores accurately predict your chance of being alive at uh, three months, six months, and a year. And so a change in MELD or UKELD score will be very significant, a very significant response. Now, if we're optimistic and hopeful, this may induce a reduction in liver MELD score and improvement in liver function of the repeated infusions. Uh, but there is a possibility, of course, that things may get worse in response to cell therapy. And for that, that's really why we chose to do a, a randomized study. So we, at the end, we will be able to know which way things are going. And just lastly, I'd just like to touch on the, the challenge of liver cirrhosis and cancer. Uh, and really, this is a difficult challenge. But people are, are now using cell therapy to try and address this. And really, it's not to address the cancer itself, because really what the surgeon wants to do is cut this cancer out. What it's to do is to try and stimulate regeneration of the remaining tissue. And so uh, this comes from Germany. And what the, the pa here's a patient, and he's got cancer in the right lobe of the liver. And that's unfortunate because the right lobe is the big lobe. And to get rid of this cancer, you really would need to cut the whole liver, right lobe out. And then the question is, this remnant part of the liver that's left is really too small to, to, to make that feasible. And in that situation, what the surgeons do, they, they cut off the blood supply to this right lobe. And what happens is this part of the lobe atrophies down and in response to this, this part of the liver lobe actually gets bigger and hypertrophies. And what um, uh, the, the group from Germany uh, uh, have been doing is been injecting CD133 autologous uh, stem cells into uh, the blood supply to this lobe to try and stimulate regeneration. And then measuring the growth rate of this segment using scans. Now, in, again, in an uncontrolled study, it does appear uh, to stimulate regeneration of, of this liver lobe, which is encouraging. But um, we do really, it would be really nice to see randomized studies in, in this area now. So, in conclusion, um, I think that there are likely to be an unlimited supply uh, of IPS cells. Um, to grow hepatocyte-like cells from. And the big thing is this word like, how functional are these resulting hepatocytes? There's a big question about how functional they are. For a genetic disease, it may be you only need to correct one gene, so that might be okay. Obviously, for complete liver function, um, you really need a hepatocyte that works fully, and that's a challenge. They need to be stable long-term if we're gonna transplant them, and that's a challenge. Um, so, it's a, it, watch this area. The liver cirrhosis, which is the most common liver disease by far, by far, um, really we have to try and, I believe, improve the scarring and promote endogenous regeneration. These are very highly expressive of chemokines, such as NCP1 and others, which drag in the endogenous cells. So, for your one cell injected, you actually get a multiplication of the effect. And in response to that, we can see an improvement in serum albumin um, and um, liver function and the progenitor cells are activated. Now, the progenitor response, uh, um, in response to the macrophages, the activation was, was, was um, something that was intriguing. And in fact, what we found is that in response to just a sin single bone marrow injection in the tail vein of the mouse peripherally, we get a very uh, large 
activation of these progenitor cells in the liver, which is quite surprising because normally, as I mentioned at the very start, these progenitor cells are only normally activated when there's advanced liver disease, severe liver injuries, and senescence. But in fact, um, a single injection of bone marrow will do exactly the same thing, and that's quite surprising. Uh, initially, we didn't believe it, but we repeated it many times, and if you irradiate the cells, the effect goes away. And it works either way, um, male into female, female into female, male into male, etc. And the liver weight increases. And in fact, if you, if you inject the bone marrow cells, um, you can then isolate progenitors from the liver and grow them at clonal density. And to be progenitors, they have to self-renew and form into biliary cells and hepatocytes. And you can actually show this in vitro uh, exactly that. And in, in the injected, the bone marrow injected mice, uh, um, you get an increase in these uh, progenitor cells activated in the liver. And, we, and in fact, it's the macrophages in the bone marrow that are responsible. Because if you just inject macrophages on their own, mature macrophages, you get exactly the same progenitor cell response of exactly the same magnitude. And in fact, if you deplete the macrophages, here, using the CD11 DTR system that we previously used, then you don't get a response. So it is a macrophage-dependent system. And we know the signaling system, and the signaling is by a tweak, which um, is, is a TNF-like cytokine. And we know that because we can use recipient mice that are knockout for the receptor, which is the FM14 receptor. If we have knockout of the FM14 receptor, um, what we get is very little or no response. And in fact, if we use donor bone marrow, where tweak is knocked out, we get, we get no response. So it is a tweak-dependent effect that the macrophages are making. So I think we know now, really, to try and stimulate endogenous repair in the damaged liver, that uh, one approach we, is to inject uh, autologous cells, and if one inject them to macrophages, they make chemokines um, to attract in the uh, endogenous cells in the liver and to get an amplified effect. This is able to decrease uh, scar tissue by expression of matrix metalloproteinases, and is also, through the stimulation of uh, tweak, able to activate the progenitor cells, and through the expression of wind, able to differentiate the progenitor cells down the hepatocyte phenotype and hopefully improve liver regeneration. So, because of its features, um, we've been um, attempting to uh, develop an autologous cell therapy in humans um, using. Um, bone marrow, uh, sorry, using uh, CD14 monocytes, which can be isolated at a high number from the peripheral blood using an apheresis machine. So if you're on your apheresis machine for a couple of hours, you can get very, very high numbers of CD14 monocytes. And we have a very simple technique for differentiating these into mature regenerative macrophages and uh, in fact, if we inject these regenerative macrophages now into animal models, this is a knock stick skid mouse where we've induced liver injury and fibrosis, what we see is a reduction in liver injury, a reduction in fibrosis, and an increase in, in liver regeneration. So the hope really is to go into a first in man study quite soon uh, uh, to, to trust this in cirrhotic patients. And encouragingly, in cirrhotic patients, we can take out their monocytes and get exactly the same regenerative uh, macrophages, which is encouraging. Now, I mentioned before that there, there are quite a large number of um, uncontrolled studies uh, in the field, and therefore uh, we sought to um, perform um, a phase two randomized control trial of autologous cell stem cell therapy for liver cirrhosis. And this is with uh, Dr. Phil, uh, Professor Phil Newsom in, in Birmingham. And really, 
what we're doing is isolating CD1 through 3 cells, and either patients receive standard care, or they re re receive GCSF, or they receive GCSF and repeat infusions of a CD1 through 3 cells. And we need to do this in 81 patients, and we're most of the way through, so hopefully we'll be able to report this quite soon. And uh, we measure their liver function, their MELD, and UKELD scores. And these scores accurately predict your chance of being alive at uh, three months, six months, and a year. And so ch a change in MELD or UKELD score would be very significant, a very significant response. Now, if we're optimistic and hopeful, this may induce a reduction in liver melt score and improvement in liver function of the re repeated infusions. Uh, but there is a possibility, of course, that things may get worse in response to cell therapy. And for that, that's really why we chose to do uh, a randomized study. So we, at the end, we will be able to know which way things are going. And just lastly, I'd just like to touch on the, the challenge of liver cirrhosis and cancer. Uh, and really, this is a difficult challenge. But people are, are now using cell therapy to try and address this. And really, it's not to address the cancer itself, because really what the surgeon wants to do is cut this cancer out. What it's to do is to try and stimulate regeneration of the remaining tissue. And so uh, this comes from Germany, and what the, the pa here's a patient, and he's got cancer in the right lobe of the liver. And that's unfortunate, because the right lobe is the big lobe, and to get rid of this cancer, you really would need to cut the whole liver, right lobe out. And then, the question is, this remnant part of the liver that's left is really too small to, to, to make that feasible. And in that situation, what the surgeons do, they, they cut off the blood supply to this right lobe and what happens is this part of the lobe atrophies down and in response to this, this part of the liver lobe actually gets bigger and hypertrophies. And what um, uh, the, the group from Germany uh, uh, have been doing is been injecting CD133 autologous uh, stem cells into uh, the blood supply to this lobe to try and stimulate regeneration and then measuring the growth rate of this segment using scans. Now, in, again, in an uncontrolled study, it does appear uh, to stimulate regeneration of, of this liver lobe, which is encouraging. But um, we do really, it would be really nice to see randomized studies in, in this area now. So, in conclusion, um, I think that there are likely to be an unlimited supply uh, of IPS cells um, to grow hepatocyte-like cells from. And the big thing is this word like, how functional are these resulting hepatocytes? There's a big question about how functional they are. For a genetic disease, it may be you only need to correct one gene, so that might be okay. Obviously, for complete liver function, um, you really need a hepatocyte that works fully. And that's a challenge. They need to be stable long term if we're going to transplant them, and that's a challenge. Um, so, it's a, it, watch this area. The liver cirrhosis, which is the most common liver disease by far, by far, um, really we have to try and, I believe, improve the scarring and promote endogenous regeneration. And it may be that cell therapy may have a role here to try and promote regeneration. Human studies are underway and I think randomized studies will be very informative to really do the experiment and tell us whether there's positive effects or not. Um, there's a review which I've written with Phil Newsom which speculates, and it is speculation at this point in time, which may be the best cell therapy approaches for different types of diseases. MSCs may have a role if one wants to reduce immune mediated liver injury for a pad site replacement and metabolic disease we may need uh, primary pad sites or embryonic stem cells or IPS drive cells and for cirrhosis we may need to induce some re remodeling and regeneration so I have to acknowledge my group who are fantastic and of course do all the work and our funders 
and um, thank you for your attention. Uh, be happy to take any questions. Hello. Uh, is it possible to get to the microphone to so people can hear? Thank you. I am interested in knowing uh, the phenotype of the microphages that they want to infuse. So um, we, we don't polarize the macrophage. They're mature, but they're not polarized. We can polarize them down, you know, if you want the, the classical or, or non-classical phenotype. And we do in our in vitro and in vivo models get different effects. But if you, if you polarize them down um, a classical phenotype, um, that can induce additional inflammation, whereas if you, um, if you, if you put them down a, a non-classical phenotype, you may stimulate regeneration, but you may also stimulate fibrosis. So it's, it's getting a balance. What we found is that the, the non-polarized but mature macrophages are the best, because when they hit the area of scarring, they're very capable of phagocytosis, um, they do make appropriate growth factors and cytokines which we are required to regenerate the liver and in fact uh, they do polarize a little bit depending on the context in situ but we deliberately don't try and steer them down. In, in fact um, we, we actually basically don't want to, to polarize them as such. Hi. Very nice work. I have a question. For how long do you follow the the macrophage that you injected? Because yeah. that you, you didn't mention, yeah. they were not very clear. Yeah, so um, that's a very good point. So we have followed the macrophages, um, and in fact, uh, they begin to disappear after a week. So it's a very short time. And so given the lack of stability of the cells, um, we were quite surprised how profound the effect was. And so um, we could only understand this when we realized that the, there was a recruitment in by the chemokines of endogenous cells to the scar area from the bone marrow as well. So you're really stimulating recruitment of endogenous. Uh, um, but in fact, um, I think the fact that the cells are not there long term may be an advantage uh, uh, for these initial studies really. Um, I think that brings a kind of safety also if, if the cells are not very long term. And um, in the context of cirrhosis, our, our patients are on a tipping point between life or death really. And just a, a small percentage change would make the difference between being at home or being in hospital. And it's really by nudging, trying to do a nudge, that you can repeat, we think, we think is, is, is the way to go. Hello. You, is it possible to use the microphone so that people can hear? Um, in cellular therapy for metabolic liver disease, you said we need to correct all the liver cells. But we, we know that in... Um, no, I didn't no. say that. So what I said was, for um, um, a metabolic disease where there is a, perhaps an enzyme deficiency, um, which is secreted, you may only need to create a small percentage of those cells. However, for a disease such as alpha-1 antitrypsin, that has two important clinical features. Number one, it secretes a protein, an enzyme, which goes to the lung and prevents Overactivation of neutrophil elastase and it prevents the actual uh, degradation uh, uh, of the basement membrane and pr the production of emphysema. So you could cure that phenotype by, by only curing a small percentage of hepatocytes. What you wouldn't cure is the other feature, which is the accumulation of abnormal proteins the abnormal alpha-1 antitrypsin polymers in the remaining hepatocytes. And those still remain a problem for the liver. Now, that is not true for some metabolic diseases, 
and for others you need, you need complete treatment. So I think the answer is complex and it depends on your disease. Yeah. Can I have another question? Yeah, sure. Um, uh, when you, you, you said you can, you, uh, for look freezes, you can mobilize and uh, collect the CT14. Do you use the GCSF mobilization regimen like you use for uh, CT34? Um, you don't need to do that. Just look freezes without mobilization? You can do that, yeah. Uh, how about, um, uh, you said uh, the, uh, the niche derived by viruses, uh, would you describe the um, uh, serotic niche? Is that, uh, did you, do you know any uh, difference in the uh, basement membrane or of, the, of the niche in, uh, in serotic liver caused by viruses? As opposed to? As opposed to normal uh, liver or, or metabolic cirrhosis? Yeah, as opposed to a normal liver, there's much more collagen, um, um, but there's one other important feature is there is formation of laminin, a laminin sheath around the progenitor cells. And I haven't talked about that, but um, we, we described that. And that goes back to a developmental recapitulation of a developmental phenotype. And in fact, um, if, if we want to expand progenitor cells in vitro, we can do this quite well on laminin. Whereas when we put them on collagen, they can then differentiate. And so the laminin niche provides an environment to expand the progenitors, I believe. And in fact, it's a very um, um, environment that's quite protected because cells are not allowed to interact. The only cells that can interact with the progenitors are the stellate cells. And they put their fingers through the holes in the laminin and uh, we believe they're secreting um, uh, notch ligands to allow expansion of these cells for, in this niche. Thank you. Okay, I think you have one short question. Is it possible to just activate the endogenous microphages? And if, if that is possible, would you get the same effect as? Yeah, uh, so that's a very nice question. So. Um, in fact, uh, we are actually doing that. Um, so um, you can use a cytokine to, to, to activate the endogenous monocytes, uh, and, and you do have an effect. It's a complicated scenario, um, but, 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 but I think you know, that may well hold a lot of uh, promise in that area as well. Okay, thank you. Okay, cool. thank you very much.